So welcome back everybody uh, for the second uh, lecture in, in the series of lectures by Matthias on tensionless ADS CFT. Uh, so over to you, Matthias. So I, I will handle questions uh, as and when they come. Okay, good. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, so let's remind ourselves where we are in the bigger scheme of things. So remember, I um, I explained to you that we are trying to approve ADS CFT. And I suggested that uh, the most uh, promising place to try to do so is to look at weakly coupled gauge theory that should correspond to a tensionless theory, that the tensionless string theory that then has a higher spin symmetry. And, uh, and the higher spin symmetry, oops, how do I have to? Yeah, so I argued that the um, that, uh, free strip should correspond to a tensionless theory that should have a higher spin symmetry. And then I argued that the symmetric orbifold exhibits such a higher spin symmetry. And therefore the symmetric orbifold of T4 should be dual to string theory at the tensionless point. And then I started to explain to you, so this we have, we can't describe in terms of supergravity. We have to describe it in terms of string theory. And I explained, started to explain to you an, a strategy for how to construct the corresponding world sheet theory. And we are in the process of understanding this approach in the context of the traditional NSR approach uh, that was uh, for the ADS three factor pioneered by Malicina Oguri. So let me briefly remind you what this theory looks like. So the, uh, this is an SL2R West Firmino-Witten model. <clears throat> and what this means in terms of the chiral fields of the CFT, it has some bosonic algebra, FN Kratzmudi algebra, plus three free fermions that are just regular nervous schwartz ramon fermions. And then I explain to you what's the representations of these SL2R fn Katsmudi algebra that appear. They are, to start with, uh, standard highest weight representations that are made from negative modes applied to some ground state that transform in a certain representation of the zero mode algebra. And then I explain to you that the representation of the ground states must either be a discrete series rep lowest weight representation or a continuous series representation. I, it uh, either is generated by a highest weight state of the form JJ that then contains J, J plus one, J, J plus two, and so on. Or it consists of all the stage with uh, eigenvalues JM, where J is a parameter characterizing the Casimir, and M is basically the eigenvalue of J3, and M is going to take the certain rational number plus all its integer shifts. And then I explained to you that because of the multitude of, of, of the unitarity bound, there would only be finitely many such representations. And in addition, you need representations that are not virus or highest weight. And these representations that are not virus or highest weight can be obtained by, by spectral flow, by starting with a regular highest weight representation and then defining a different action on it. And the way you should think about it is that that describes the sector with winding number along the boundary of ADS3. So we look at the original highest weight representation, we think of it in terms of the untilted nodes. The tilted nodes act on the original highest weight representation. And then this defines for you an action of the untilted nodes. And I sketched to you what this looks like. And in particular, what we saw was that this is not, uh, doesn't have a bounded L0 spectrum because that's the line L0 is equal to zero. So everything to the right of it has negative L0 eigenvalues, everything to the left of it has positive L0 eigenvalues. So this representation is unbounded. And I, as I was explaining to you, that's not that different to what happens when you do string theory in flat Minkowski space, because then also the momentum ground state has conformal dimension that's as negative as you want. So this is simply a description of the space of states, uh, Alam Aldesino Oguri, we are following their old description. And what we are trying to do is analyze the physical states of that theory. And what that means is that you have to, this is a variant description, so you have to impose the physical state condition, which means that the super conformal generators have to kill the states and the Rosoro generators have to kill the states. That's implied by that. And then you have the mass shell condition that L0 is equal to a half, say, in the nervous schwartz sector. And if you work out what this mass shell condition looks like in the unflowed sector, then that's just the conformal dimension of the ground state, which is the Casimir of the SL2 representation divided by K plus the excitation number plus the conformal dimension from any additional internal factor is equal to a half. And uh, this is an equation that will play a prominent role in the following. So now, as I 
I was ending last time with explaining, so, so we take this world shift theory and now we are just enumerating all the states that satisfy these conditions. So obviously we are going to find infinitely many states like in any string theory. So in order to understand what sort of spectrum you get, you have to keep control of some quantum numbers, so like, just like you do in flat space string theory. You keep control of the spin and of the mass and so on. So what's the corresponding analog of what you should do in the context of ADS3? Well, the dual, you think you want to think of it in terms of a two-dimensional conformal fit theory living on the boundary of ADS3, and therefore you should classify your states according to the quantum numbers of that dual CFT. And in particular, uh, the, the standard quantum number by means of which you organize the spectrum of a 2D CFT is the scaling dimension. And the key way of identifying what the scaling dimension of the space-time theory is in terms of this world sheet description is very simple. You see, the world sheet theory is the SL2R by Sumino Witten model, and it has a global SL2R symmetry, which rotates the entire ADS3 space. And as it rotates the entire ADS3 space, it'll also rotate the boundary. And therefore, it'll correspond to a global conformal transformation on the boundary. And the natural identification is that the Möbius group of the boundary CFT, which is the group generated by L0, L1, and L minus one, is exactly the zero modes, it's exactly the global transformations of the ADS space as described from the Wesselmino Witten point of view, which are just the zero modes of the currents. The zero modes of the currents are the global transformations, and therefore they should correspond to the global Möbius transformations on the boundary. Now, obviously, the dual CFT will also contain various oral generators, but they are much harder this, to describe from the point of view of the, uh, of the world sheet theory. But in order to organize the spectrum, it's really enough to know the L0 eigenvalue because, I mean, as you probably know, when you describe a conformal field theory, you typically write down the partition function, and that's basically just keeping track of this quantum number. So for us, it will be sufficient at this stage just to keep track of the J30 eigenvalue on the world sheet, because that's going to classify the physical states according to their space-time conformal dimension. So the aim of the game is we're going to look at all of the states satisfying these conditions on the world sheet. And for each state, we are going to work out its J30 eigenvalue. And then we are saying, okay, that means there's a corresponding a state with that eigenvalue, that space-time conformal dimension in the space-time theory. And we simply do this for all the states on the world sheet theory, and thereby we reproduce the entire spectrum of the space time theory. And the question is, what, do we go, what are we going to get? I mean, this is now a totally doable problem because you see, you have I've described for you the world sheet theory in detail. So now it's just a matter of enumerating these conditions and working out these eigenvalues for the resulting states. And then we know what the spectrum of the dual CFT will look like. And because, as I was arguing in the first lecture, we are interested in the tensionless regime, we should do this for the smallest possible value of the level, and the smallest possible value of the level is k equals to 1. You may be worried that for ADS3, there's really a continuum of levels because SL2R is non-compact, the level isn't quantized, but because you have an SU2 factor, <clears throat> And the SU2 factor also has to be so supersymmetry or uh, the critical dimension forces the level of the SU2 factor and the level of the SL2 factor to be the same. <clears throat> and since the level of the SU2 factor must be a positive integer, I1, 2, 3, and so on, the level of the SL2 factor must be a positive integer, I1, 2, 3, and so on, and therefore the smallest value is k equals to 1. So that's what we are going to do. We're just looking at this very specifically defined world sheet theory at k equals to one. We're looking at all the states that satisfy these conditions and enumerate their eigenvalue with respect to J3 zero and out pops the spectrum of the space-time theory organized in terms of conformal dimensions of the dual CFT. So that's, uh, that's what, I, what I described here. Now, obviously this spectrum contains many representations. As I said, there are the discrete series representation and the continuous series representations. So in principle, we would have to do this for all of these representations and all of these representations together with the spectrally flowed images. Now at this stage, I can't justify this very well, 
but I'll ask you to just come along with me and I'll suggest we just look at the continuous rack series representations for reasons that will become clear later on. And we look at their spectrally flowed images. So we're not looking at the entire spectrum, we're looking only at a piece of it. And uh, why you have to look at this piece of it from the point of view of the neve schwartz ramon description is a bit obscure, but it will become clear when we later on discuss the hybrid formulation. And we also see part of the problems here, and I'll, I'll allude to that later on. Well, okay, Matthias, so I have now... a knife question for you. <coughs> or can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. please. So uh, uh, here also there is a, like in usual string theory, the, 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 the string, usual string theory, there's a Hagedorn growth of states. Yes. Uh, and yes. Uh, it does not require the discrete, uh, the discrete spectrum doesn't have this growth of states. Uh, I mean, you, you, I mean, you need all. I mean, in order to get, I mean, the physical states get sort of truncated because of the uh, because of the multi-signal bounds flow, right? Uh -huh. And then you just need. I mean, because of that, you need spectral flow in order to have a chance to get a Hagedorn growth of states. Uh -huh. And then, and then, um, and then the continuous representations. I mean, you you just need them because. Um, I mean, from a world sheet point of view, you need them because of modular invariants. I mean, they just appear in the fusion rules. You just can't uh, get away with them. Whether the discrete spectrum by itself would have a Hagedorn growth, I'm not 100% sure. The discrete spectrum is actually quite tricky to evaluate uh, for reasons I allude to later on. So it's not that easy to actually work out how many states you have in the, in the discrete spectrum. The continuous spectrum is much, much easier. And that will become clear as we go along. I see. Thank you. Okay, so what we have to do, so, so that's what you have to do. We're looking at the spectrally flowed continuous series representations. And we know that the physical state condition is going to just remove two bosons and two fermions. The, the, the sort of the G0 condition, uh, this condition. So this condition will basically just remove two bosons and two fermions, just like in normal string theory. Because we're in critical string theory, so one set of bosons and fermions gets removed by looking at states that satisfy this condition. And then you have one set of bosons and fermions that have become spurious and therefore they decouple. So you lose two degrees of freedom bosons and two degrees of freedom fermions. And we are not, no, nothing specific, nothing very different is happening here. So we are just, that's just going to be part of the counting. So the interesting condition to solve is this condition, the Maschel condition. And that will tell us what the physical spectrum is, as you'll, as you'll see in a second. So what's the Maschel condition? Well, remember, we are interested in the spectrally flowed sector. And under spectral flow, that's the formula for what L0 is in the spectrally flowed sector. Now, I know what L0 tilde is. L0 tilde is the formula I wrote down before. It's C over K plus H0 plus N. But now I have to add to it minus W times J3 tilde 0 minus a constant, plus minus a constant term. So let's evaluate that at k equals to one. So then uh, this just becomes minus a quarter. So this is the minus a quarter w squared. This becomes minus w j three zero tilde. And I call this minus w m, where m is the j three zero tilde eigenvalue. I had a j three zero eigenvalue before I apply the spectral flow or morphism. And then the central charge, I have to divide by k, but for k equals to one, this just becomes the Sorry, not the central charge, the Casimir uh, divided by K. This just becomes the Casimir. And in the continuous representations, the Casimir is a quarter plus P squared. So, so therefore, that is an F set H0 equal to zero. So this term is absent. And then this formula is just the Maschel condition in the W spectrally flowed sector, where if I'm looking at a continuous series representation, the Casimir will be equal to a quarter plus P squared. If I were to look at a discrete representation, the Casimir would be equal to minus j into j minus one. Okay, but not a difference. Now, the big difference between the continuous and the discrete series representation is how we can solve this equation. You see, in the discrete series representations, we have the states are labeled by j and m, and the Casimir is equal to minus j into j minus one, and m minus j is an integer. So you see, the natural attitude you would want to have for this uh, equation is that you simply solve it for m. I mean, m appears in one spot. So 
you can solve this equation by simply trying to find the value for m for which this equation is satisfied. Now, in the continuous series representations, that's all you have to do, because in the continuous series, remember, so in the continuous series, and this is discrete series, in the continuous series, the Casimir is equal to a quarter plus p squared, and m is equal to alpha plus z. So in particular, you see, for, for any choice of p, any value of m will appear for some suitable choice of alpha. So if I take this equation and I solve it for m, then I find a suitable representation where this will survive. Whereas if I try to do the same thing for the discrete representation, it's much harder because you see the Casimir, I can plug in the Casimir as a minus j into j minus one, but then when I solve for m, I get this uh, consistency condition that the m I find must differ from the j by an integer. And that becomes a very difficult number theoretic question. So therefore, in a discrete series, it's actually quite hard to work out exactly what the spectrum is because m and j are correlated by this condition. Whereas in the continuous series, m and j are uncorrelated. m is any number you like, and j or the Casimir is just a quarter plus p squared, independent of alpha. So that's the reason why the analysis in the continuous series representation is much simpler than in the discrete series representation. So let's just do it in the, in the continuous series representation. So then that's pretty simple. And let's also set p equal to zero for simplicity. And again, I'll explain to you later on why these choices are the right choices to do. At this stage, it's not so obvious that that's the right thing to do. Okay, so let's write down this equation again. So this is the equation. And now I'm setting c equals to a quarter because I'm setting p squared equal to zero. So this is p squared equal to zero. And then I simply uh, solve this equation for m, right? So I move uh, w m to the other side, then I divide by w. So I have a one over w outside. The Casimir is a quarter. A quarter minus a half gives you the minus a quarter. Then the minus a quarter w squared gives you the minus quarter w squared and n is the n. So that's the solution of this equation. And this will be of the form alpha plus z for a suitable alpha. So there will be one SL2R representation where this state will become physical. So the attitude I take is I'm looking at some excitation and I'm asking for which value of alpha does this become a physical state of which value of alpha and M. And that's the value of M I have to pick. And then that fixes the corresponding value of alpha. So somewhere in my spectrum, that state will become physical. That's just like solving for P in terms of the excitation in flat space. Okay, so now we've worked out what M is, but remember, we, want, we are interested in trying to understand the eigenvalue of J30 of each state that we get, right? For each state that we get, we want to ask what's the J30 eigenvalue because that's the L0 eigenvalue in space time. So we don't want to know M, what we want to know is the J30 eigenvalue and the J30 eigenvalue because of spectral flow it differs from the J3 tilde zero eigenvalue, which is M. Remember M is the J3 tilde zero eigenvalue, i.e. the eigenvalue before spectral flow by shifting by WK over two, which for K equals to one is just shifting by W over two. So I'm not actually interested in M, I'm interested in M plus W over two, which is the space-time conformal dimension of the corresponding physical state. And when I add this, this simply turns the sign of this term, right? This term is just the w, w over four, if I add w over two to it, this term picks the opposite sign. So this minus sign becomes a plus and this plus sign becomes a minus. So I still have minus one over four w, but the minus w over four becomes a plus w over four. That's all there is, right? So what we've done, we've simply solved the physical state condition on the world sheet and we interpreted the result in terms of the space-time conformal dimension. Now, if you look at the space-time conformal dimension, that looks extremely suggestive, at least for anybody who knows the symmetric orbifold theories. And I'll review symmetric orbifold theories in a second. So for those people who know symmetric orbifold theories, they should say, aha, at this stage. And for those who don't, you have to wait for a little moment before you see that this is the, a good and interesting formula. So for those who know, you see these are, these are just the, the twisted mode and that's the ground state energy in the W cycle twisted sector. 
So what you learn from this is that if you say that k equals to one and you look at all the physical state that come from the continuous series representation, which in some sense is the bulk of the states, then the conformal dimension of the space-time state that you get has exactly the formula that looks like a symmetric orbital theory. Where the, from the sector with W spectral flow, that looks like the symmetric orbital formula for the sector with cycle length W, and I'll explain this in a second. So that's the first indication that this theory really wants to be a symmetric orbital because its time spectrum looks like a symmetric orbital. Now, obviously, we have to be a little bit careful here because we have to understand exactly what is its the symmetric orbital of. I mean, what are exactly the degrees of freedom that survive? And I'll come to that in a second. And this analysis won't be totally clean in the Nervous Schwartz Ramon uh, description, but at least we see the gist of it already here. We see that this space time spectrum wants to be a symmetric orbifold. And now we just have to uh, cross, uh, dot the I's and cross the T's to work out exactly which symmetric orbifold it is and how it exactly ties together. Incidentally, I should mention that you see, if you take W equals to one and N equal to zero, if you take W equals to one, this term becomes zero. And if you take N equal to zero, this term becomes zero. So what you see, there are states with zero conformal dimension and they come together with states for which H bar, the right moving conformal dimension will be non-trivial and vice versa. So what this also tells you is that the space-time theory contains many chiral fields and the chiral fields are what you think of as being the massless higher spin fields I mean, that's the correct dictionary between massless high spin fields on ADS3 become chiral fields on the dual two-dimensional CFT. And therefore we see that this theory really is tensionless in the sense that it has a massless uh, spectrum of higher spin fields. So we are on the right track. This is sort of the right, it has exhibits this tensionless behavior that I was advocating before. And its spectrum looks very much like the symmetric orbital. So we seem to be on the right track towards identifying the exact world sheet theory that's dual to the symmetric orbifold of T4. Okay, but before I get into that, I need to review a little bit what's the symmetric orbifold so that we really know what we should be expecting and that we see what, what corresponds really to what. Okay, so let me recall a few basic facts about the symmetric orbifold of T4. So the symmetric orbifold of T4, as I say, you so T4 means you have basically four bosons, four free bosons, and four free fermions. And I'll call them, and uh, so, and, and, and then you're looking at N copies of those. So let's, let's in order to not overburden the, 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 the notation, let's just look at one of these N4 bosons. So let's look at one boson here and let's call this boson dx. This is one of the four bosons and the other three will do exactly the same thing. And then the fact that we have uh, N copies, let's introduce a label A, where A runs from one to N. And we do the same thing for the other three bosons and the other four fermions, but to get the gist of it, let's just look at, concentrate on one of these bosons from the T4, but look at all of its N copies. So now what do we have to do when you look at the symmetric orbifold of this theory? Well, so we've taken N copies, and now we have to divide out by the symmetric group, but the symmetric group basically just acts as a permutation on this index A. So this, uh, the symmetric group are permutations mapped from one to N to one of N, and they'll map any given number A to pi of A, where pi is an element of SN. Okay, so what is the symmetric orbifold theory? So basically you take all the, so let's call the modes of this uh, alpha A, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to look at all the states that are of the form alpha A1 minus N1 up to alpha A N L minus N L acting on some ground state. And uh, let's take this ground state for simplicity to be uh, the vacuum. I mean, it doesn't really matter. We can deal with the momenta of the, the torus compactification later. And then in the untwisted sector, what we're going to do, we're simply keeping all the states that are in the invariant under the permutation, where the permutation acts on the indices A, right? We take the state, 
And then the permutation acts on it by permuting all the indices. And we're looking at those linear combinations that are invariant under the symmetric group. That's what's normally called the untwisted sector of an orbifold. I mean, that's a general orbifold construction. Whenever you look at the orbifold of a CFT, you start with by looking at all the states of your CFT that are invariant under the action of the orbifold group. And that's what you call the untwisted sector. Now, in conformal field theory, that's actually not all there is. The, the orbifold theory has additional states, which are called twisted sectors. And the way you can think about them is that suppose you have some, 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 some manifold. I mean, think about this geometrically. So this is the manifold. And think about taking the orbifold of this manifold by some group. Then what you're interested in are the closed strings propagating in this manifold um, after you've divided by G. Now, the closed strings that propagate in this manifold are of two kinds. There are closed closed strings that begin and end at the same point of M. They're obviously closed strings once you divide by G, but there are also closed strings that are not closed in M, but only closed, become closed after you divide out by G. These are the strings that look at, start at one point of M and end at another point of M, where these two points are related to one another by the action of a group element G and G. So these are open, they look like open strings in your original theory, but they are closed because their endpoints are different in the original theory, but in the quotient theory, they are the same, i.e. they're images of one another under the orbifold group. So that's where the twisted sectors come from. So in addition to the original closed string states that are obviously part of your spectrum, you're going to get new sectors, and these new sectors will be labeled by group elements in the orbifold group. Because for every group in element in the orbifold group, there is a new closed string whose endpoints differ by the action of the orbifold group, which is therefore closed once you've identified points that are mapped to one another under the orbifold group. And therefore you get new closed strings that you didn't have before. These are the so-called twisted sectors. And to start with, you would think they are associated to the group elements of the orbifold group. But if you think a little bit about it, because of the, you have to demand that everything is invariant under the group action, they are really associated with conjugacy classes of the orbifold group. So a conjugacy class consists of all elements that are related to one another by conjugation by another group element. So two elements are in the same conjugacy classes, G and H are in the same conjugacy class if G is equal to K times H times K to the minus one. That's what it means to be in conjugacy class. So we expect that we are going to get additional sectors which are going to be associated to conjugacy classes of SN. Now, what are the conjugacy classes of SN? So remember, SN is the permutation group of mapping N integers to N integers. So what are the possible permutations? Well, the easiest way of writing down what the permutations are is to write them down in, in a, a, a cycle. So for example, in say, let's S7, you have the permutation one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Say so that would be a permutation, right? That's the per that maps uh, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1, 4 to 5, 5 to 4, 6 to 6, and 7 to 7. And obviously, any permutation you can write in this sort of cycle shape. You simply write down, for everybody, you write down where they get mapped to, and then you simply enumerate uh, all of the different uh, sectors. Now, if you think about it, what does this, the conjugacy class do to you? So suppose you conjugate this permutation by a permutation, that is, you, you don't look at this permutation, but you first look at permutation pi, then you apply this one, and then you apply pi to the minus one. The only thing it does, it, it changes the numbers that appears inside these cycles, but it won't change the shape of the cycles. So the conjugacy classes of the symmetric group are really parameterized in terms of cycle shapes, i.e. in terms of partitions. So what this really is, is saying, this corresponds to the cycle shape three plus two plus one plus one, which is a partition of seven. That means there's one three cycle, one two cycle, and two one cycles. And any permutation that's conjugate to this one has the same cycle shape, i.e. has one three cycle, one two cycle, and two one cycles. So the conjugacy classes are exactly labeled by the different the cycle shapes. In fact, if it has a different cycle shape, it's clear that it can't be conjugate to another. So the Conjugacy class are exactly labeled by the cycle shapes, 
And the cycle shapes are nothing but another way of thinking about partitions of N. So you can write them in terms of Young diagrams. And if you know this sort of stuff, there's lots of pretty mathematics associated to it. Okay, so this is, so we're going to get a twisted sector for each such cycle of uh, SM, and we're interested in the limit N goes to infinity. So basically you get a cycle, for you get a twisted sector for any, for any, uh, any partition of uh, if infinity, if you wish. And the, the, the way the partitions you are interested in are those that you, you ignore the ones. So you're, you're interested in keeping the, the sort of non-trivial pieces, and then you add as many ones as you need to make up Sn. So that has a stable description when n goes to infinity. So as n goes to infinity, you can think of the, of the, of the conjugacy classes as being labeled by the non-trivial cycles, and the rest are just there to make up the numbers. Okay, so that's all the twisted sectors of the symmetric orbifold theory. Now, as I was arguing, the symmetric orbifold theory is the moral analog of superang mills or free superang mills. And in superang mills, the gauge invariant operators are traces of, uh, of uh, fields that transform in the adjoint representation, and you have to take the trace to make them gauge invariant. Now, what you are really interested in when you study the ads cft correspondence is uh, the single trace operators because the single trace operators will correspond to the single string degrees of freedom from the point of view of, F of the ADS space. So our string theory will not see the entire uh, symmetric orbifold spectrum. It will only see the, the, the analog of the single trace states because you see, we're looking at perturbative string theory. We're not looking at string field theory. We're not looking at the multi-particle states associated to the string. And therefore, we should only see the single particle spectrum from the point of view of the symmetric orbifold. Now, if you think about it, the obvious, almost canonical way of identifying what the single particle states are, are those that consist of a single cycle. And the multi-particle states consist of more than one cycle. So this will be a two-particle state because it has two non-trivial cycles in addition to as many trivial cycles as you need. And the single particle states will be the ones that are associated, for example, for S7, there would be one that's one, two, three, four, and then you have five, six, seven. So you have one cycle of length uh, four, and you would have one cycle of length five. And this, if you think of as being the single particle states, this, the analog of the single trace states for n equals to four. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a full symmetric orbifold, but we are only going to look at states <clears throat> that come from the untwisted sector and from the twisted sector. But in the twisted sector, we're only going to look at the single cycle twisted state, uh, sectors <clears throat> because that's the analog of a free super, uh, of the single trace states in free super mills. Okay, so now we have to understand what does the spectrum in a single cycle twisted sector of the symmetric orbifold look like? Is, is, is this clear so far? Please, please ask if, if this is... Um, if this is unclear. So, so let's try to understand what this looks like in the W cycle twisted sector. So remember, as I've just said, in the W cycle twisted sector, so we are only looking at one boson for simplicity. Remember, there are really, there are really four of them, but we're just going to look at one of them. So this alpha parameter is just keeping track of the one to N, and we are, we are suppressing the index labeling the four free bosons and the four free fermions not to clutter notation. Okay, so what happens in the W cycle twisted sector? So we have our field uh, DXA, and what will happen, so let's take this W cycle to be the cycle one, two, up to W. I mean, up to conjugation, that's one representative of this conjugacy class. So what does this sector look like? What this sector looks like is if I start with the field DXA, and I take it once around this uh, insertion point, I come back with the field DXA plus one, because that's exactly, you see, I said that the states you're going to get, they differ by the, by the group element. So if I uh, and go ones around here, the state I'm getting differs by the action of the group element, but the group element just acts as a cyclic permutation. So it takes the state in the eighth copy and it maps it to the A plus first copy. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what's going to happen. And then obviously the last one is going to become the first one. So this is for A is equal to one to W minus one. And then DXW 
you want to go around this point, come back to the X1. That's the cyclic behavior of these W many fields. Okay, so how can I describe the degrees of freedom in this W cycle twisted sector in a sort of uh, coherent and pleasant fashion? So the idea is that I do the following. I define now the following fields, uh, DXL, and DXL will be the sum from A is equal to one to W, and then it'll be DXA. So these are all fields of Z, and then I combine them by E to the two pi I L over A divided by W. So I'm looking at, uh, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at uh, the, uh, the linear combinations where I group these DXAs together in such a way that they, uh, that uh, I take these linear combinations where these are phases, right? So L is a number that runs from zero to W minus one or one to W. And I'm simply combining these fields by adding them together with right? these phases. Now, why is this interesting? Now, if you, if you look at it, what happens as I take DXL around this insertion point? Well, you see, as I take DXL around this insertion point, this guy is going to become DXA plus one, right? That's uh, this rule here. And therefore, I need another factor of e to the two pi i a over w. So what this tells you is that they go into e to the minus two pi i a l over w times uh, dxl. So by going through this, uh, by going through these linear combinations, what I'm getting are <clears throat> I'm getting a linear combination that behaves diagonally. Under this, uh, under this, uh, inserting the twisted sector, any sec any any state in this twisted sector. But what does what does this mean? Well, this mode, you see, these are linear combinations of spin one fields, so they will still have a mode expansion. And what this means is, if I write on the mode expansion, it will be of the form alpha l r, right? So alpha l are the modes of this field. And then it goes like Z to the minus R minus one because it's a field of spin one. So a field of spin one has that sort of mode expansion. And now, since I know that under X under Z goes to E to the two pi I Z, what do I know? So DXL of E to the two pi I Z is equal to this sum over R alpha L R E to the minus two pi I, um, R times uh, Z to the minus R minus one, right? So, I mean, the, the minus one obviously doesn't do anything to the E to the two pi I, but the power of R means that I'm going to pick up this piece and then obviously I'm picking up this piece. But now I know that this should be equal to this. So this is equal to E to the minus two pi I L over W times the sum over R, alpha L R, the Z minus R minus one. And therefore by comparison, I see that this coefficient must be equal to this coefficient. I, what I learned from that is that R must be of the form L over W plus Z. So what happens is that once I diagonalize the action of this uh, cyclic symmetry, when I move around, what this means is that my mode numbers must be fractional and they must be fractional. There must be one over W fractional, right? So this is a L over W and this is for the field L and L takes the value say zero to W minus one. So for the combination L equal to zero where I just add them all together, my node number will be still integers. But if I combine them with the phase E to the two pi A over W, their mode numbers have to be one over W and so on. So what you see is that out of these W many fields that you started with, so here we had basically W many fields that play a role. We've made one, again W many fields and all of these fields look like the original field except that their mode number is now not integer, but it's fractional. It's a one over W, two over W, three over W up to W minus one over W and obviously integer. So the effect, what happens in the W cycle twisted sector is that it looks exactly like the untwisted sector, except that the mode numbers of the generators that appear here 
are fractionally molded. That's basically what the twisted sector does for you. The twisted sector behaves like the original sector, except that your mode numbers are now uh, uh, W uh, fractionally molded. And you can calculate as a ground state energy that you pick up. And there's a sort of Casimir ground state energy, which you can work out. And the ground state energy is of the form C over uh, 24 times W squared minus one over W. That's, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not deriving this here, but this is something which is not too hard to work out that you're, you're picking up this uh, Casimir ground state energy. So what happens is that in the W cycle twisted sector, the mode numbers become W fractionally molded, and there's a ground state energy of the form C over 24 times W squared minus one over W. Now, with this knowledge, now we can go back to this formula. And now you see, this is just exactly the W fractionally mode numbers we've just seen. You see, you have exactly the same modes, it's exactly the same combinations. You have four bosons, so each of them can be fractionally molded. But instead of them being integer mode, now they are W fractionally molded, And that's exactly what we saw here. These modes are all now W fractionally molded. I've done this for one boson. and I could have done it for all the other ones and all of them behave the same way. So this is just from the fractionally molded uh, modes in the W cycle twisted sector. And you see this is uh, W squared minus one over W times T over 24. So what it's telling you is that uh, C is equal to six. And uh, so if you compare it with this formula, you deduce that C is equal to six and C is equal to six is exactly the central charge of T4 because you have four bosons and four fermions. A boson has central charge one, a fermion has central charge a half. So four times a half is two together with the four is six. And that reproduces exactly the ground state energy that we saw before. <clears throat> so we see, so, so, so this is the, the reason why you should be excited, or you may be excited when you see this formula, because this formula looks exactly like the spectrum in the W cycle twisted sector of the symmetric orbifold of T4. You see that the central charge is six, and you see all the fractionally moded modes appearing. Okay, is that clear? Now, obviously, yeah, we have to be a little bit worried here because I haven't quite explained to you what N exactly runs over, right? So there's this N here. Sorry, I should say this N and this N have nothing to do with one another. This is the symmetric orbifold N. That's the number of excitations on the, on the, on the world sheet. And this N, I said, counts all the excitations that are around, right? If you, if you think about starting with this formula, this N, counted all the excitations of all the fields on our world sheet, coming from ADS3, coming from S3, and coming from T4. Whereas at the end of the day, I want this only to correspond to excitations in the T4. So how does this fit together? Well, for the case of this nervous schwartz ramont description, the following argument is a bit formal, but I give a cleaner version of this argument uh, later on. Um, uh, let's see when I'll get to it today. Um, but there is a, a clean derivation of it, but let's just understand the gist of it. Now, okay, the following is maybe, I'm not sure this will convince you or not, but let me at least tell you, because that's sort of the nervous schwartz ramont way of counting these degrees of freedom. So as I alluded to before, the level one theory in this nervous schwartz ramont description is a bit subtle, because you see, you, we have an ADS3 factor, that's SL2R at level one, that's fine. And we have an S3 factor, that's SU2 at level one, but it's the super conformal SU2 at level one. And after you remove the fermions, you get a bosonic theory at level minus one. Now a theory at level minus one is something of a bit of a disaster because that has negative central charge. So you're not entirely sure what this is going to do to you. So it's not entirely clear how you should count degrees freedom here because somehow the S3 factor be has become to look a little bit like something that's a bit of a ghost because its central charge is minus three. So you're not entirely sure exactly how to treat it. Now there's sort of a suggestive formal way of how to make sense of this. And I just want to sketch it for you. So you can see that even in the nervous schwartz ramon picture, we see that we are going to land on our feet, but I'll explain this more carefully later on. Okay, so what's the, what's the quick and dirty way of seeing that we really end up with the symmetric orbifold of T4? 
Well, the idea is, or the observation is, and that's due to an old paper of Goddard, Olive, and Waterson, that SU2 at level minus one, together with one U1, has a free field realization in terms of four symplectic bosons. Now, four symplectic bosons, I'll describe them to you in much greater detail later on, but the way you can think about them, these are basically two beta gamma systems at spin a half. So a symplectic boson for me is the same as two a spin a half beta gamma systems. And, and we'll see them later on in more detail. So basically, these are ghosts. These are ghosts that want to remove fermions. So in some sense, what this suggests is that the SU2 factor is going to remove some fermions for us. So if we do a rough and dirty counting, uh, the way the counting would go as follows. You see, we have SL2R. So remember, SL2R has three bosonic and three fermionic degrees of freedom. I mean, the, I mean the, the bosons transform in the adjoint and the fermions transform in the adjoint, the adjoint is three-dimensional. And then we have to impose the physical state condition. And as I said, the physical state condition is going to subtract minus two plus two. So you end up with one boson plus one fermion. And now we have to deal with this SU2. So we have an SU2 level minus one plus three free fermions. This is what we get if we decouple the SU2 level one theory, you get a bosonic algebra level minus one plus three free fermions. And now the idea is that you combine this boson with SU2 level minus one. That's basically exactly this. So this therefore is equal to this is therefore equal to the two beta gamma systems from here. And the two beta gamma systems, they will remove exactly four fermions, namely the remaining fermion from here, plus three of the fermions from the SU2 factor. So this argument basically tells you that after the dust has settled, there are no physical, no physical excitations coming from the SL2 plus SU2 sector. I, the only thing that remains, only the T4 remains. I would expect that you only get degrees of freedom associated to the T4 degrees of freedom. And you see this fits together with the fact that we do get indeed the correct ground state energy that looks like a C equal to six theory corresponding to the T4. This looks like T4, right? Because this is a C equals to six. <clears throat> so, so this somewhat dirty counting lands on your feet and it really suggests that after the dust has settled, after all these cancellations have taken place, what we really end up is exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. So that's the first indication that is K equals to one, this level one, Never schwartz ramond walsh theory really has a space-time spectrum that's exactly the symmetric orbital of T4. Okay, so, but I should be honest, there are things I haven't yet properly explained and that's why we have to come to this uh, a little bit more carefully. Remember, there were other things I've, other dirty things I've done along the way. So for example, I said P equal to zero by hand for the continuous series representations. And I discarded the discrete series representation states. So you may be worried that what I've done isn't quite uh, consistent. So you see that this is more or less on the right track and it gives you a sort of an intuition of how these things fit together, but it's not a totally satisfactory answer. And the reason it's not a totally satisfactory answer is basically to do the fact that you get this funny SU2 factor at level minus one and it's very hard to see precisely in the Nervish Schwartz Ramon description, what this will do to you. So therefore, we have to find a somehow better way of describing this theory. And the basic idea is that we should go to the, what you want to think of as being the green Schwartz version of this world sheet theory. I mean, just like in flat space, there's Nervish Schwartz Ramon and there's green Schwartz. And what I'm going to try to argue for you now is that the green Schwartz version of this theory, which is in this context called the hybrid formalism, is unambiguously defined for k equals to one and gives you a cleaner way of actually understanding exactly the spectrum. And if we do that, and that's what I'm about to explain to you, 
we land on the nose on the symmetric orbifold spectrum of T4. Okay, so this is uh, now, uh, now I have explained to you what we can understand from this nervous Schwartz Ramon from the traditional Maldesino Gori picture. And now we have to sort of upgrade our description and go to this hybrid formalism. And in the hybrid formalism, as I'm about to explain to you, this will become in some sense cleaner and it'll be, it'll be uh, much more unambiguous. Okay, are there any questions about the nervous Schwartz Ramon description? Yeah, Matthias, can I ask a question? Uh, so if, if you have two operators in the uh, continuous series, and then in their uh, OPE, there won't be any operator in the discrete series. Is that right? Well, not sure, not sure. I mean, so I, at this stage, this looks really a little bit inconsistent. But the promise we are really at k equals to 1. And at k equals to 1, the funny things happen because of this SU2 factor level 1. So what you are saying at generic k is certainly not true. I mean, at generic k, you find discrete series representations in the OP of two continuous series representations. Uh, I see. But, but level one is highly special and, and you'll see this in a second, what's so special about level one. And somehow this is virtually impossible to see in the nervous schwartz ramon sector because your fermion sits in the adjoint representation. Oh, that's too big to start with and you can't remove these degrees of freedom easily. Okay. There's another. Yes, there's another question. Uh... Could you please uh, what's it? Could you please explain the computations of calcium energy in the twisted sector? Right. So this is a bit of a yeah. So I could explain this. So let me maybe I can actually can I add a page? Let me try to add a page. Okay. So let me add a page, and then yeah, this is a little bit. Uh, okay. So so how does this work? So so we are in the uh, say the uh, the uh, the W cycle twisted sector. So I'm afraid I don't have all the details, uh, but I'll, I'll explain to you how the calculation works. So the stress energy tensor is going to take the form that you're going to take the um, N minus R alpha R, and R will here run over all fractional modes, maybe with a half. That's the correct stress energy tensor in the, oops, something happened. I just got dis disconnected, right? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, your slides went off. Okay, so somehow, somehow uh, my screen sharing stopped. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let me try again. Yes. Okay, so back. here we are again, right? So, so, so that's what the Verasoro algebra looks like in the in the twist detector. And uh, what I'm saying, so what I mean here is that R here runs over um, um, Z over W, right? So you have to sum over all the modes, also the fractionally moded modes. Now, the tricky bit is that there's going to be some normal ordering constant. And as people know, these normal ordering constants are always a little bit tricky to evaluate. So the simplest way of evaluating it, and, and, and this normal ordering constant, if uh, sorry, this normal ordering constant will appear for delta n equal to zero, and that's basically the number we are interested in, right? This is the Casimir energy. I mean, the question is, if I apply this, I mean, this is normal ordered. If I apply this on a ground state. This term, this term would give me zero, this term would give me zero on the ground state. And the question is, what's the value of L0 on the ground state? And that's the normal ordering constant that appears in this definition of the Verasoro generators. Now that's a bit, so obviously you can go ahead and try to really calculate the Verasoro algebra and keep track of normal ordering and you'll find out what this constant is. But that's a bit of a tricky way of doing it. So the, the, the smart way, I mean, it's a slightly, um, but I mean, it's ba you basically know that this is a correct way of doing it, is to look at the L minus one mode on the twisted sector ground state. So let's, let's call the twisted sector ground state like so. So what is the L minus one? And, and let's for simplicity take W to be odd because uh, it's a, a slightly easier if I do it for W odd, you can do the same thing for W even, but it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so what? Is the what terms survive in the L minus one node? Well, so we have to pick two modes from here that sum up to minus one, 
but both have to be negative. Because if one of them is positive, then obviously the positive modes will go through and kill the ground state. So the terms that survive for L minus one are the terms where one of them is, uh, well, both of them are negative. So this will be the terms of the form um, alpha minus, uh, minus one plus R, alpha minus R on the vacuum. Each of them will appear twice. So that'll kill the factor of a half. And then R will run from, um, actually, maybe I write this as uh, L over W. Let's write this as L over W. And then L will run from, so L will run from, so the zero mode will kill it. So I have the minus one over W and then the last one will be W minus one over two, I think, right? That's the, that's the last one where both of them will be negative. So this is the expression for L minus one on the twisted sector ground state. Okay, so I, I, I'm explaining to you a shortcut for how to evaluate this normal order and constant. And what I'm saying is let's work out L minus one. And why is this interesting? Well, the idea is that once I've worked out L minus one, I can work out L one. So let me, sorry, go, go back to blue. So what is L one on L minus one on zero W? Well, I mean, L one, uh, you're going to apply all the, the modes that add up to plus one, but the only ones that cancel will be those where they pairwise cancel. And remember, the commutation relation will be of the form alpha R, alpha S will be R times delta R, R minus S, right? These are bosons, so these are the commutation relations of them. So when I work this out, what I'm going to get is the sum from one to W minus one over two. And I'm going to get a factor that goes like well, uh, one minus L over W times L over W, right? Because I get the L over W piece from this mode. I mean, there's a positive mode killing this one that'll produce for me the, the mode number. And there'll be a positive mode killing this one that'll produce this mode number. Now this sum you can work out and I've forgotten exactly uh, the formula, but you see, you know what this is. This is going to be two L zero acting on on this, because you see, you can replace this by the commutator. So that's the cheap and easy way to get to the L0 eigenvalue, the ground state eigenvalue, by simply looking at the commutator of L1 and L minus one on this ground state, which is much easier to calculate. And when you do the sum, and, uh, and I mean, it's just the sum, I just can't remember by heart what this is, but you just plug it into Mathematica. And what you find is that this becomes W squared minus one over 12 W, times a zero W. I mean, this is just the, the mathematics, this is just plugging this into Mathematica. This uh, sum is just W squared minus 12 W. And now you see what this means is that L zero is therefore equal to, L zero on this uh, twisted sector ground state is therefore equal to W squared minus one over 24 W, because I have to divide by this two, this 12 becomes a 24. And that's the formula for, and here I've done this for one free boson, right? And then you can convince yourself that this just scales by the central charge. So it's one central one free boson has C equals to one. And then if you do it not for one free boson, but you do it for four of them and you do it for four fermions, you get four times this result for the four bosons plus two times this result for the two four fermions. So what, what, uh, what this really is, is equal to C over 24 times W squared minus one over W. I mean, I haven't really explained to you that obviously for a free boson that I write C or one is the same thing, but if you do it for two bosons, it's just going to add because you get this normal ordering in terms for two of them and so on. So it just goes like this. Does this answer your question? Well, let's hope so. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm back uh, here. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, so so now so so now now I have to do it slightly more honestly, and the more honest way of doing it is by going to the hybrid formal. So now, typically, when you mention a hybrid formalism, people switch off because they think it's very complicated, and it is somewhat complicated, but. I hope you can just uh, go along with me and understand the gist of it. And the gist of it is actually not that hard to understand. Now, 
it is a bit, so in principle, there's a field redefinition that takes you from the Nuri Schwarzman one description, Alain Wallacino Gori, to the hybrid formalism a la Berkowitz Waffer Witten, but it's a very complicated field redefinition. It involves many bosonizations, refermionizations, rebosonizations, and so on. So I'm not going to explain the whole process to you, but basically you introduce ghosts, then you combine these fields and bosonize and ferminize them. And once the dust has settled, what you end up with is a Resumino Witten model based on the super Lie algebra P as you 1, 1 slash 2. And this Resumino Witten model sits at level K. And I'll explain to you in a second what this super Lie algebra is. And then what happens to the T4 is that you basically retain the T4, except of the four fermions of the T4, two become spin one and two become spin zero, which is what you call the topologically twisted sigma model on T4. And then in this description, you have a certain cohomology you have to calculate, and that calculates the physical states of that theory. Now, there is, I think, very good evidence that this is a legitimate field redefinition, and therefore that the berkowitz rafa witten theory, the hybrid formalism theory at level K is exactly the same string theory as the nevis schwartz ramont description at level K. I mean, there was some debate early on about this, but then various people, including a former student of mine has checked that the spectrum really seems to be exactly the same. And therefore, I think the conventional wisdom is that this is a legitimate field redefinition, and this is just an equivalent way of describing the same theory. Now, people have checked this for a large case, so far, and in fact, this works as far as we can tell for any value of k greater or equal than 2. For k equals to 1, the nevis schwartz one description is a bit delicate, as I've just alluded to, we get to get this funny SU2 level minus 1, which we are maybe a little bit suspicious of. But let's just take this at face value, and because this works for all level k, at least this should give us a legitimate way of defining what the ADS3 theory is at level k equals to 1, if this theory makes sense at level 1. And as you'll see, this theory is perfectly unproblematic at level one, but something very remarkable happens, which is the reason why you can't really get it from the nevis schwartz ramon description. Okay, so before I get into this, so what is this supergroup PSU 1, 1 slash 2? Well, so if you think of it as a supergroup, it's basically uh, uh, a four by four matrices. They have a two by two block that's SL2R. Or, I mean, your SL2R is the same as SU1, 1, which is really this first part. So what this really means is the bosonic algebra has an SU1, 1, and an SU2. So the diagonal blocks are an SL2R, which is the same as SU1, 1, and an SU2. And then you have off-diagonal blocks, and the off-diagonal blocks are fermionic generators that sit in the bifunder. I mean, they, sit, they are two by two matrices, so they transform as as two, a two-dimensional representation with respect to the SL2, SL2R action, and it's a two-dimensional representation with respect to the SU2 action. So that's what PSU 1, 1 slash 2 is. So if you think of it in terms of the Lie algebra, we are going to have uh, three generators that make up SL2R, which we'll call JA. We have three generators that make up KA, uh, uh, SU2, that we, which we'll call KA. And then we have fermionic generators and there are going to be eight of them, right? There are two times two, because this is the two by two matrix, and that's a two by two matrix, but then we have two of these. So we have eight fermionic generators, and we have three bosonic generators here and three bosonic generators here. So it's a super Lie algebra that has six bosonic generators and eight fermionic generators. So it's super dimension is minus two. And because it has managed in the dual Coxner number, the conformal dimension of the affine Katsumudi algebra will always be minus two because it's k times the dimension divided by k plus the dual Coxter number. But because the dual Coxter number is zero, it's k times the dimension divided by k is the dimension. But in the case of super Lie algebra, it's the super dimension. And therefore, uh, the central charge of this theory will always be equal to minus two. And uh, we'll see this at various points later on. Okay, so that's what this PSU 1, 1 slash 2 the uh, algebra is. And if you want to look at it a little bit more details, that's what it looks like. So, so just to talk you through this, so this is basically the SL2R. And the SL2R now appears at level K. Then these generators are just the SU2 at level K. Again, they appear at level K. And then these are the ways the fermions transform under J. Maybe they transform in a spinner representation. So these are Pauli matrices, and these are some signs that you need to get the real structure of the SL2R right. 
And then finally, the anti-commutator of the fermionic generators gives you a central term, gives you an SL2 current, and gives you an SC2 current. So that's simply the affine Katz-Moody algebra based on PSU 1, 1 slash 2 at level K. And it's okay, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's, it's really not that bad, right? It's really SL2 plus SU2 plus fermions. Now, why is that a very natural super Lie algebra to appear in this context? Well, if you think about it, the, the global generators, the global symmetries are the zero modes of these super Lie algebras. So are the zero modes. So what are the zero modes? The zero modes of the J, they correspond to L plus and minus one and L zero, as we argued before. Remember the space-time Möbius group, uh, the SL2 R zero modes on the, on the world sheet. Then the Ka zeros, they will become generators Ka zeros. They form an SU2 algebra, the zero modes of an SU2 algebra. And then this S alpha beta gamma, the zero modes of those. So, so this is, so all of these has been one fields now, and they all have integer mode behavior. So there are zero modes of these fermionic generators. And what they correspond to are just the G plus and minus, plus minus a half modes, and the G prime plus and minus, plus minus a half modes. And if you know a little bit the representation theory of the n equals to four superconformal algebra, this is the global subalgebra of the n equals to four superconformal algebra. Right, so the n equals to four superconformal algebra in two dimensions, the, the Verasaurus symmetry and the global part is just the Möbius symmetry, then it has an R symmetry, which is SU2, and the global part is just the SU2 zero modes. And then it has four uh, supercharges, but it has, because there's been three half fields, the global part is the plus and minus a half mode. So you get, uh, so these are two and these are two. So there are four superconformal generators and each of them two mode numbers survive plus and minus a half. So you get eight of those. So you see, these are six bosonic generators. These are eight fermionic generators. And if you look at the commutation relations here or anti-commutation relations restricted to the zero modes, they give you exactly the global part of the n equals to four superconformal algebra of the space-time theory. So this is just like in Green-Schwartz, it makes the space-time supersymmetry manifest. You see, the space-time supersymmetry is the fact that the dual CFT is an n equals to four superconformal algebra, and its global piece is the Möbius, the SU2 zero modes, and the plus and minus a half modes of the supercurrents. And they are just to be identified with the zero modes here, and the commutators here reproduce exactly the commutators of the n equals to four superconformal algebra. Again, I mean, it's, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the n equals to four superconformal algebra, but it's it's just a little bit like the super Verasoro algebra, a little bit more complicated. I'm just telling you that this is exactly how this dictionary works. The commutators that I've written down here are exactly the commutators that you see in the n equals to four superconformal algebra. And that makes a lot of sense because you see the global symmetries on the world sheets, the zero modes will commute with the physical state condition. And therefore, they will map physical states to physical states. And that's what this global n equals to four superconformal generators in the 2D CFT will also do. I think there's a question. Yes. So let me read it out for you. Loga is asking, ah. just to confirm, could we construct the generators of the whole affine algebra PSU11 slash 2 uh, at level k on the RNS side, even for k equal to 1? No. Well, I mean, not really. You see, I mean, in the NSR description, I mean, it's really like going from NSR to Green Schwartz. And you see the fermions that originally in the adjoint representation, that's like the vector representation in NSR, become fermions that sit now in the spinner representation, which are these sort of representations. So it's not that you can, I mean, this is like asking, can I construct the Green Schwartz fields directly in the RNS formalism? That's pretty tough. Right, because I mean, you know that. I mean, here, I mean, here you don't have a you, you don't have a Ramon in the Schwartz sector. There's, I mean, these can generators, the fermionic generators, from the point of view of the RNS generators, would be fields that map the Schwartz sector to the Ramon sector because they act like space-time supersymmetries. So it's really like Nevis Schwartz Ramon going to Green Schwartz, and therefore the Green Schwartz fields are not easily accessible in terms of the Nervous Schwartz Ramon's description. But just like in that case, you know that 
the space-time symmetries must be there. And in the Green-Schwartz formulation, they are manifest. And here in the hybrid formulation, they are manifest. And, and that's how they are manifest, because that's how they reproduce the space-time supersymmetry. Does, does this answer your question? Yeah, so just to, just to make sure I understood. Uh, so this would emerge after you do a sum over spin structures in the Yes, argument. absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes, so it's yes. Uh, yes, that's... it's not easy to see because you see, I mean, these are fermions and the fermions come from the Nervish Schwartz Ramon sector on the world sheet, right? I mean, the Nervish Schwartz Ramon description. So, I mean, the fermionic generator must Nervish Schwartz Ramon. So it's not easy to see. In, indeed, I, I did skip a little bit here over. So, in order to really get this spectrum to work, so this is part of uh, what I sort of uh, skipped a little bit here. And really, to get this work, you really have to sum over both Nervish Schwartz Ramon sector. And then, it, then you get the correct uh, symmetric orbifold spectrum. So in the nervous schwartz ramon description, you really have to sum over them, whereas in the hybrid formalism, there's no sum over spin structure, there's no spin structure, it's, it's more like Green-Schwartz. Yes, yes, absolutely. We need picture changing operators in this formalism, and we will come back to that later on when we calculate correlators. Yes. In fact, that's an, an important uh, uh, subtlety that, that we needed to address when calculating the correlators. Thanks. Okay, so, so, so that's what the sort of the hybrid formalism looks like. It has this global symmetry sort of baked into the cake and there are the zero modes of this uh, PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 algebra. Now, as I've been trying to argue, the level one description and the schwartz ramon formalism is a little bit delicate, but in this hybrid formalism, level one is actually relatively direct to understand, and there's nothing bizarre happening. There's nothing, you see here, here you can't decouple the fermions anymore, just like you did in the Nervous schwartz ramon So you're not getting an SU2 level minus one theory anymore. SU2 is at level one, that's what you get. And you can't just subtract out the fermions because the fermions sit in by spinner representations and they're just not behaving like the fermions of the Nervous schwartz ramon And that's exactly like the fermions transforming the vector representation of the space-time symmetry and they're transforming the spinner representation in the green schwartz formulas. So in this description, we can just go ahead and analyze this theory and see what we get. And as I'll explain to you, this is a perfectly legitimate, perfectly fine world sheet theory, but it has some very unusual features. Now, how can you most easily see the special features that happen at level one? Well, what's important is that, as is manifest from this description, this super affine Katsmodi algebra contains an SL2R level K and an SU2 level K subalgebra. So the bosonic subalgebra is really SL2 level one and SU2 level one. Now, if you know a little bit about the representation here of SU2 level K Katsmodi algebras, you know that at level one, there are really only two possible highest weight representations that are allowed because SU2 level one is a null vector at level two in the vacuum sector. And as a consequence, you can only have the singlet and the doublet as the highest weight representation for SU2. The longer representations are not compatible with the null vectors of the SU2 level one vertex operator algebra if you want to praise it in fancy words. So we can ask, what does this imply for the representation theory of this PSU 1, 1 slash 2 level 1 affine Katsmodi algebra? So what I have in mind is I'm trying to look at the, at the, at the representation. I pick some ground states. Then I have all my oscillators on top of this and the Ks and the Ss. And I'm asking what are the possible ground state representations that I can have that are compatible with the symmetry coming from PSU? One comma one slash two. So let's just look at the ground state. So the ground states are obviously mapped into one another just under the zero modes. So I have to ask, what is the representation of the zero modes on the ground states that are compatible with level one, i.e. compatible with the constraint I know from here? Okay, so what are the ground states going to look like? Well, the zero mode algebra is just a copy of PSU one comma one slash two. It has three bosons, six bosons and eight fermions. And the bosons just make you SL2 plus SU2, so I can organize it in terms of representations of SL2 and SU2. So each sum in here labels a representation of SL2 and SU2. So the first entry is a representation of SL2, and the second entry is a representation of SU2. And being a physicist, I label the representations of SU2 in terms of their dimension. 
So n is the n-dimensional representation of SU2. And the representation of SO2 are I labeled in terms of the spin and this alpha parameter. So this is for the continuous series representations. But I could do the same thing for the discrete series representation. It wouldn't make any difference. And I'll, it, it, you'll see in a second why this doesn't really matter that much. OK, so I start with some state. And I have eight fermionic zero modes. So I can make four generator, four creators and four annihilators. And I can say that this representation with which I start gets annihilated by the four annihilators. So then I'm going to get the Clifford module generated by the four creators, I by the four fermionic zero modes that do not annihilate these states. OK, so if I apply the one, I get four sectors, which are these four sectors. Then I can apply them twice, but I can't apply the same fermionic generator twice. So I'm going to get six terms. So I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Then I apply them three times. Then, because I, I can choose every one at most one, I get four terms again, one, two, three, four. And then I apply all of them, there's only one term left. So this is a usual Clifford representation of this fermionic zero modes. And that's the structure I'm going to get if I look at the highest weight states. Now, remember the fermions transform into spy spinner representation. So as I apply one fermionic zero mode, I'm going to move the spin of the SL2 orbit either up by a half or down by a half. And I'm going to move the spin of the SU2 bit up by a half or down by a half, which in terms of dimensions means the dimension goes up by one or it goes down by one. And the four terms I'm going to get are just the four combinations I can have. I can have both spins up, one spin up, one spin down, one spin down, one spin up, one spin down, one spin down. These are basically these four terms. So this is the Clifford representation and there is nothing I can do about it. And a generic representation of the zero mode algebra will always have that form because these zero modes, they just act and that's what they produce. Now, if you stare at this representation and you remember that SU2 is at level one and only n equals to one and n equals to two are allowed for n equals to two at level one, we see that we have a problem because you see, even if you take this to be the one dimensional representation, Halfway down the line, you're going to produce a three-dimensional representation because you're going to get this representation where the spin has moved up by a whole unit rather than by a half. I, the dimension has jumped up by two. But that's not compatible with the representation theory of SV2 level one. So therefore, what you learn from that is that at level one, the generic representations of the zero-mode algebra are not allowed representation of the affine Cartoli algebra because they lead to representations of SU2 that are too big. I should say, this is one way of seeing this. There are other ways of seeing this. It really comes down to the fact that the affine Katsumuji algebra at level one has many null vectors, and the null vectors are not compatible with the generic representation. A generic representation is allowed at level one. The only representations that survive at level one are the short representations. And if you do the analysis carefully, you find that the only representations that are allowed are of this kind. They only involve three summons, so they're really ultra short. And then you see these fermionic zero modes. I said they, they generate a Clifford algebra, but at the right hand side of the anti commutator, remember you get terms that are expressed in terms of eigenvalues of JA and KA and some central term. So there's going to be, in order for them to be short, I, for, order, for some of them to annihilate, when you would expect them not to annihilate, you get some constraints on the values of the K, J, and K eigenvalues. And when you do this, what you learn that the shortening condition is that this spin of this sum and here has to be equal to a half. That's, the, that's required in order for this to be compatible with the anti commutation relations of the super conform of the S generators of the PSU 1, 1 slash 2 algebra. So what you learn is that at level one, somehow this theory has far, far fewer representations than generically. You see, if K is bigger than one, there's no problem with this, right? For K equals to two, no problem to having, you can start with one and you have three here, you get generic representations galore. But at K equals to one, something very special happens. Namely, you only keep short representations. And in fact, the spin can't take arbitrary values anymore. The only value that's compatible with the representation is j equals to half. And therefore this continuum, remember in the discrete series, we had j was equal to a half plus i s. And this parameter s is what is this continuum of the long string sector 
that I argued in my first lecture was the reason why people said that the West Amino written model can't be dual to the symmetric orbifold. So this parameter S has been frozen by the representation theory at level one. The continuum has disappeared, and therefore you have a chance for this to really be dual to the symmetric orbifold on the nodes. And this also motivates, in retrospect, why I was allowed to set uh, uh, P. Actually, I called this P, sorry. I, should, I called this P before. And I said, I look at the sector with P equal to zero. And the reason why I'm doing this is because the in this hybrid formalism, I know that these are the only representations. I mean, we didn't know at the time, but in retrospect, we know that these are the only representations that survive, that are the only representations that are compatible with the algebraic structure of this P as you one comma one slash two level one resumino written model. So, and, and also you see the discrete representation, you could run the same argument for the discrete representations and you find exactly the same condition. So the only discrete representation that you're allowed to have is the representation with J is equal to a half. But you see the discrete representation with J equals to a half is really in some sense contained among the continuous representations with J equals to a half. Namely, it's just the representation with alpha equals to a half. It's the representation where the J3 eigenvalues and the, and the spin agree up to an integer. So the discrete representation is allowed discrete representation. There's only only one. It's really part of the continuous series spectrum. So what you learn from this is because of this interesting algebraic structure, there's only one representation that survives. Well, except there's still this parameter alpha that survives. But the spin is fixed by the consistency of this construction. Okay, so that tells you what the spectrum is. So now let's do the counting of uh, physical degrees of freedom. So in order to do that, the easiest way of doing this is to observe that this theory actually has the free field realization in terms of what we like to call four symplectic bosons, but you may want to call two spin a half beta gamma systems and four free fermions that are given uh, whose commutation and anti-commutation relations are. Yes, all vertex operators are in this representation. Well, class spectral flow. I haven't yet mentioned, uh, here I've discussed the highest rate representation. So I've repeated the analysis, analysis for, for the highest rate representations. And then the picture is that this, the full spectrum will be this highest rate representation plus all its spectrally flowed images, both left and right with the same amount of spectral flow. Uh, and, and that closes under the OP? Like the OP yes, closes? That, Yes, that, that will close on OP. And, and the simplest way to see it is because it has a free field realization. So let me just briefly explain to you the free field realization. So this Lie algebra, super Lie algebra, has a free field realization in terms of these free fields. So whatever you, you, you call them, these are the commutators and these are the anti-commutators. And you can check that if you write them, these are the ways of writing the generators of P as U1, comma one slash two in terms of these uh, free fields. So the J's are bilinears in the symplectic bosons, the K's are bilinears in the fermions, and the supercurrents, the, 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 the super uh, the fermionic generators involve one, fer one symplectic, one fermion and one symplectic boson, and one symplectic boson and one fermion. Now, actually, this construction gives you U1, comma one slash two, because there is an additional, there are two additional U1 fields that you can make which is sort of what you know. You see four free fermions don't give you SU2 level one, they give you SU2 level one plus U1. So this is the SU2 level one, that's the corresponding U1 from the four free fermions. And the four symplectic bosons do exactly the same. They give you SL2R level one plus uh, one U1. So you have two additional U1s. And in order to actually obtain P as U1 comma one slash two, you have to somehow remove these U and V generators. And the way to do it is to uh, gauge the combination Zm is equal to Um plus Vm, you have to set this to zero. What I mean by this is you have to demand that the physical states are annihilated by Zm. And then that actually removes two sets of oscillators because then the descendants by, by Z become null because Z has trivial commutator. So the, the Zm, Zn commutator is zero. So therefore, if you demand that all the physical states are killed by the positive uh, uh, or non-negative modes of Z, then you're really losing two sets of oscillators. Namely, you also lose the Z descendants because they, those you quotient out, they become spurious. So, so that's the free field realization. And in terms of this free field realization, people have studied this PSU, well, have studied this algebra and 
it is believed that on this set of representations, plus the spectral flowed images, it closes. And in some sense, it has to close because you see, these are the only representations there are. I mean, there aren't any other representations of this vertex of algebra. So therefore, the OPE of any two such representations must close on it. So, yeah, maybe I don't, in view of time, maybe I don't want to go into too much of the read. So you can describe this. Uh, so this looks a little bit like a Ramon sector representations. You have the, the zero modes and you define some, some, some basis on which the zero modes act. And then maybe that's something we delegate to the exercises. Then you can work out the eigenvalues of J30, K30, U0, L0, and V0. And what you see from that is that that really gives you this representation. The ground state gives you this representation. C a half alpha, where alpha is equal to m1 plus m2 mod integer. And uh, so, so this is the states that correspond to m1, m2. They correspond to that. And then if you apply an S generator on it, that involves a single fermion. So the states that involve a fermion on this, so, uh, so a fermionic zero mode on this, or, a or a, a, a one of the two fermionic zero modes on this, they then correspond to the other two factors. They correspond to C1 alpha one and Z0 alpha one. And remember, this is, uh, this is what we saw here, right? So you reproduce exactly this representation in terms of this free field realization. You get this term from the ground states and then the fermionic generators. Sorry, this is alpha plus a half. This is alpha plus a half. These are the, the fermionic, uh, the, the, the other summons that you get from that. So, so you can reconstruct exactly this representation. You, you see it appearing. And uh, so there's an explicit free field realization from it. And then as I just alluded to, then you have to spectrally flow this, uh, uh, this theory. And now in this free field realization, you can directly spectrally flow the free fields. So you don't have to spectrally flow the the PSU 1, 1 slash 2 generators, you can directly spectrally flow the free fields. You do exactly the same as we did before. Then if you translate it, that means that the, the, the PSU 1, 1 slash 2 spectrally flow as such. So that's just imitating the spectral flow analysis, but now doing it in this hybrid formalism. So you, you identify the one and only highest rate representation, and then all the rest is spectral flow. And that's how spectral flow acts on the PSU generators. And what's important is how it acts on the various aura generators, because that will tell us what the, the physical spectrum will be. <clears throat> because remember, now we have to impose the physical state condition and uh, impose the constraint that the ZN uh, modes kill. And uh, what does this do? Well, if you say count the bosons, you have four bosons from the T4, and you have four symplectic bosons from the SU1, PSU1. Sorry, this should be a P here should be a P as you 1 comma 1 slash 2 level 1 theory. But uh, actually, sorry, it shouldn't be P. It should be, it should be U. Sorry, I, 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 I misspoke. You see, because before I impose the Z condition, I'm not describing P as you, I'm describing U 1 comma 1 slash 2. So U 1 comma 1 slash 2 has four symplectic bosons. And then so I have eight bosons to start with. And then I have basically the Verasaro condition where we move two bosons and this ZN condition, which reduces U1, 1 slash 2 to P as U1, 1 slash 2, we move these two bosons. So effectively, you kill from the eight bosons four, and you're retaining four bosons. And that's reproducing this dirty counting I was describing early on, that you're just retaining the degrees of freedom of the torus. You, you certainly kill four bosonic degrees of freedom, and you had eight to start with, so you're left behind with four. And then you just have to study the, 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 the zero mode condition. So if you look at some arbitrary states, say involving these to, uh, torus bosons on one of these ground states, then the, you have to impose the yet zero condition that will fix you the difference between the M's. And then the L zero condition has this form because you see L zero, this is the form of L zero. So it's going to be L zero tilde plus W times K30 tilde minus J30 tilde. So it's uh, it's this, right? It's uh, So the L0 of the ground state is zero because it's four symplectic bosons, four fermions. The ground state energy is zero because the Casimir energy is canceled. So it's just the excitation number plus W times these charges. 
the K3 zero eigenvalue on the ground states, I didn't explain this carefully, is equal to a half. This is here. So this is equal to a half. And then, so therefore you end up with this equation is equal to a half and that you can solve again for W, uh, sorry, that you can solve for J3 uh, tilde zero. So J3 tilde zero will go like N over W plus a half. But then the real J3 zero, you have to add to it W over two by the spectral flow. So you learn that the space-time conformal dimension of the state corresponding to this state in the world sheet theory will have space, have uh, the value N over W plus W plus one over two. And therefore it looks exactly like the, this state in the symmetric orbit form. It looks like the BPS state in the W cycle twisted sector that has, so this is something I haven't explained, but in this super conformal symmetric orbit form, the ground state is not the BPS sector. The BPS state is fermionic excited and its conformal dimension is actually W plus one over two or W minus one over two, there are two of those. And what you get is that these states on the world sheet correspond exactly to these states in the symmetric orbit fold, namely the bosonic excitations with fractional remote number on the BPS state in the, the W cycle twisted sector. So this is the analysis for the bosons. The analysis for the fermions work similarly, and you reproduce exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbit fold of T4. And you can here really see which state goes exactly to which state. Now, I apologize, this was a little bit quick towards the end, but in some sense, this is exactly the same calculation as I've done before in the Nervous Schwartz Ramon sector. So I don't, didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I hope you, you got the gist of it. The gist of it is that in, the, in this hybrid formalism, the representation theory is highly constrained. There is no continuum. So you just have this, there is no continuum, then you have spectral flow and the spectrally float counting works exactly as for Nervous Schwartz Ramon. But now you get a clean description for why only four bosons survive and likewise for the fermions. And you reproduce exactly the spectrum of the, the single particle spectrum, the single cycle twisted sector spectrum of the symmetric orbifold um, from, from this world sheet description. And, uh, and so, so that's sort of the more honest way of, of doing this uh, state counting relative to the nervous schwartz remont description. Right, so this is a very good question. Uh, it's a very good question. So I, I've cheated a tiny little bit here in that the physical state condition in the hybrid formalism is actually very complicated to solve. It's really a BRST common. So the way it works is there is an N equals to two super conformal algebra in this hybrid description. And you have to look at a combined cohomology of the fermionic zero modes. Actually, there's an N equals to four, and you have to look at the G plus zero and the G prime plus zero and look at some co combined cohomology. Now, unfortunately, that cohomology is very complicated and nobody has ever evaluated it properly, as far as I'm aware. I mean, there, so I mentioned earlier that my student, my former student, checked that the two descriptions agree with one another, the hybrids and the NSR description agree with one another, but he didn't do this in, 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 in complete generality. He just looked at a few low lying states and identified them with a few low lying states. And the full cohomology, unfortunately, is very, very complicated to calculate. So we haven't actually honestly calculated the cohomology of the hybrid formalism, which is what we should do. In the hybrid formalism, there is there are additional ghosts that is so-called rho and sigma ghosts. So I should have said there are some ghosts as well. So plus ghosts. And unfortunately, this is very complicated. And while we are working on this, I, I think this is uh, it's not that easy. So what we've done is we've 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 taken to believe that the, it is equivalent to Nevis Schwartz Roman for generic level K. So we, have, we, we, we interpret these tests as proving that this is the same. And then you can simply do the sound. The, the cohomology looks essentially independent of K. So you know what this cohomology does for a generic value of K. You know how many degrees of freedom it removes from the hybrid formalism. And then we've simply taken this result and also applied it for K equals to one. So this is a little bit not completely honest. So we haven't honestly solved this um, this uh, BRSD cohomology, we have really just sort of argued that the physical state condition will basically remove again two bosons and the appropriate number of fermions, but we haven't really derived this from first principles. So this is another 
gap in our argument that one would need to fill. But I think it just reflects the fact that this hybrid string is quite complicated to work out and this BSD cohomology is, uh, is very difficult to evaluate explicitly. Are there any other questions? Yeah, but uh, do you have something like a B ghost? Uh, like something well, like so, yes, I mean, I mean, so you introduce this row and sigma ghost and then e to the i sigma is the sigma ghost, uh, it's the C ghost and e to the minus i sigma is the B ghost or the other way around. So you bosonize the, B, the, 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 the BC system. But as I said, in the description going from Nervish Schwartz Vermont, to hybrid, you introduce the ghosts of the nervous schwartz moment and then you bosonize, refermionize, and you combine it with the other fields. So it's a bit hard to keep track of all the ghosts of the original NSR description in the final hybrid description. Uh, I mean, is this better than, you know, like say this pure spinner kind of uh, things where this B ghosts are pretty complicated things? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what the, the status of this is relative to the standard uh, the pure spinner formalism, but it, it's certainly of the same flavor. Now there may be a prop. I mean, I, I guess you're alluding to problems maybe with higher genus surface uh, computation. So we haven't tried to go that deep into the, the weeds yet. So we've taken this hybrid formalism. We've uh, essentially use the PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 symmetry and we've treated the ghosts or this cohomology in a relatively cavalier fashion by just saying it's going to remove two bosons and the appropriate number of fermions so that for generic K it does the right thing but further than that we haven't understood this cohomology. Okay, thank you. I mean it would be very good if somebody could do that but it's not that easy I feel. But for calculating correlation functions, do you need to know the structure that uh, because there are can be spurious poles? I mean, you, you need the ghost correlators, right? Right. So, okay. so I'll explain to you tomorrow, uh, or rather on Thursday, uh, what what we know about the, the the calculation of the correlators. We haven't really honestly calculated the complete correlators. We really tried to to see that they reproduce the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators. But you're right, in order to do this completely honestly, one would have to do this more properly and that we haven't yet done. Let's see. Thank you. Uh, but, I mean, look, I'll, I'll try to, uh, what you'll see is that it's quite, what, what we can see without going into the weeds about the ghosts is the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators emerging. And that's quite stunning in my opinion. I mean, there's something very interesting happening for this theory, which we can understand on the level at which we understand evaluating the actual coefficients of these correlators. We, we just see the structure of it matching the structure of the symmetric orbifold. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I don't see any further questions. So let's thank uh, Matthias for a, a very nice lecture. And uh, we will uh, meet again tomorrow at 11 o'clock to continue with Shiraz's lectures. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Matthias. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.